This is Dr. Tom Bernacki, and this is why I take vitamin K2 every single day. There's actually some strong evidence for some benefits and not a lot of strong evidence for other benefits that are claimed, and we're starting now. So vitamin K2 is something that is a little bit newer. Before, people always confuse this one with vitamin K1, which is involved with blood clotting and blood clot formation. So there's a lot of overlap, but there's actually three types of vitamin K. There's K1, there's K2, and there's K3. K1 is involved in blood clotting. This one, K2, is most well known for its bone effects, its calcium effects, and its artery effects. And we'll talk about a few others as well. But this is the update of all the newest studies that I've been able to find. The World Health Organization, FAO, say that people probably only get five to 25% of their daily recommended value of vitamin K2. There's two types, MK4 and MK7. MK7 lasts a lot longer, and it's found in fermented foods, natto, soy, sauerkraut, cheese. It was also made by GI tract fermentation. There is no specific dosage recommendation for vitamin K2 given by the government, but there is one for vitamin K1. You don't want to overdo it on vitamin K1 if you're on blood thinners, for example. Our standard recommendations for K1 is 90 micrograms per day, on average 90 to 120 micrograms. But for K2, no official recommendation. But most of the studies I'm going to go over, they recommend up to 120 to 200 micrograms of K2. Now that's micrograms, not milligrams. And what you want to get is either MK4 or MK7. MK7 is the longer acting component of vitamin K2. You can get vitamin K2 through diet, but supplements can help as well. K2 is different than the electrolyte potassium, which you might get in your Gatorade type drink. There's three different types of vitamin K. K1 is phyloquinone, vitamin K2 is menaquinone, and then vitamin K3, not really important, but I list it here. I promise we'll give you a simple guide at the end, but you want K2 to come in the MK7 formulation in your supplements. But the beauty is that vitamin D and K2 can come packaged. You don't have to go crazy and buy a million different supplements. We're going to give you a simple, easy plan that I follow myself at the end. So in medical school, we learned that calcium goes into the bone. So it might make sense to eat calcium, right? Well, now the studies are actually showing that calcium might not be the healthiest even supplement at all. So these bottles that you're paying for with calcium in it might be a waste of money. But what really happens in the studies now are vitamin D help get calcium into your bloodstream and then vitamin K2 makes sure it gets into your bone. It makes sure your muscles get stronger. It makes sure your blood sugar levels are lower and make sure that that calcium doesn't get into your blood vessel walls, making them thick and hard. And then to top it all off, magnesium can help all of them out. I like this summary on vitamin D and cofactors impact on your health. The clear number one is healthy food. If you get good sunlight and diet, this is the biggest component. Number two is exercise, strengthen your bones, strength training, and cardio. Then vitamin D supplements, that's when they become useful. Magnesium makes vitamin D more effective, as does omega-3. And then K2, iodine, zinc, and boron help vitamin D be more effective. So K2 should be a little bit bigger, but I see calcium crying in the corner there. So sad. There is a lot of evidence supporting vitamin K2's role in bone health. It's very well studied and has been for years at this point. Vitamin K2 essentially takes the calcium from the blood and puts it into the bone. Vitamin K2, especially MK7, does a few things. It essentially causes gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid residues. And what that does is it activates matrix GLA protein and osteocalcin. These are important in taking calcium and putting it into bone. So essentially, when you're getting proper vitamin K2, your teeth will be stronger, your bones will be stronger. All these things will do a little bit better. You'll have less osteoporosis. At the very least, it reverses the benefits of a deficiency. So that's what the studies show. Vitamin D is really important for taking it from our digested foods and putting it in the blood. But then K2 is responsible for taking it in the blood to the bone. 
So it's very effective in that regard. There were some controversies surrounding studies on vitamin K2's effects on bone strength, but I would say as more time goes on, there's more of a positive effect on the good results. And a lot of these studies usually come down to how long we're using it and what dosage we're using it. The difference is some use as low as 90 micrograms and others use as high as 360 micrograms on average. Some people even superdose with vitamin K2. So I've seen people taking basically 5,000 micrograms going a little bit higher. Number two, there are potential impacts of vitamin K2 on cardiovascular health. Specifically, this includes heart valve calcifications and artery calcification. There is a lot of evidence now that vitamin K2 can limit heart valve calcifications and artery calcifications. This is essentially calcium, instead of going into your bone, can build up in your arteries. Now, I've seen a lot of great people make presentations and essentially due to warfarin and blood thinner use, it's been recommended to lower our vitamin K intake and potentially those people have much higher calcium buildup. That's something that's still to be proven, but it kind of makes sense to me. There are now observational and randomized control trials on vitamin K2's impact on arterial stiffness and they are very encouraging and they are very promising. Calcification of arteries is a very big problem these days. It is one of the major causes of arterial stiffening. Take a look at this CT angiogram. This is someone with calcified, and that means bone in your arteries. It stiffens them so they're not flexible. It decreases the blood flow. You get cold toes or blood flow. As a foot and ankle specialist, I check the posterior tibial artery pulse, the anterior tibial artery pulse. This sets a good guideline. If those feel great, then you don't have to do much more. And the way you feel it is bounding pulses up and down. And we also check the capillary refill time. That means when you squeeze the toe, does it refill instantly? If it doesn't, if it's more than three seconds, we can use a computer to perform a test. We could perform what's called an ankle brachial index. So that's basically comparing your arms to your feet. Are there potential blockages somewhere? And if there are blockages, so for example, if one ankle is much worse flow than the other or compared to your arms, then we might want to do more testing. You can check the toes and then you can order imaging. You can get what's called a CT angiogram. But what I do is I work with a vascular surgery team. So I work with great vascular surgeons. Essentially right away, they can do a test which is an angiogram where they can release dye. They can essentially check if anything's narrowed or blocked, and then you can correct it. So this is one of the images where you could see, is there cholesterol built up? Is there a plaque? Is there calcification? But one of the things that can really help with this is vitamin K2. You want to get that calcium into your bone. So studies show vitamin K2 is very beneficial with patients with aortic valve calcification and a couple other studies too combined with vitamin D. Now it won't reverse your arteriosclerosis and make you like a baby again, but it can prevent it from getting worse. And especially the earlier you start, the more benefit it can have. The tricky part with these studies, and I think the comments in these videos always are, somebody will say something like, hey, I'm in horrible shape. I'm basically 80 or 90 years old. Will vitamin K2 clean out all the calcium in my arteries? Practically, the answer is no. We can't expect to go from being like 80 or 90 years old with decades of bad buildup and degeneration and go back to being a teenager. We can't do that for our skin. We can't do that for our arteries. And in fact, most of these anti-aging gurus, they don't live longer themselves. Most of this stuff is shown to kind of be a scam. There's a big one in the news right now. I won't get into it. One of the anti-aging leaders that promises that they can reverse their age is just very difficult to do. So from that standpoint, vitamin K2 can prevent the buildup of more calcium, but it's not going to turn you into a teenager. That's probably the best way to put it. And that's how the studies have found it. Is vitamin K2 safe? The reality is it's usually pretty safe. There is a pretty good overall safety assessment and there's a lot of positive outcomes from studies regarding vitamin K2 supplementation. Some even take much higher dosages. There are other claims for vitamin K2 such as anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory benefits. 
these are claimed, but the studies are lower level. They're not as strong. And essentially, the benefits just are not there. It's not really recommended. There are safety considerations and interactions with blood thinners. It's not as much as vitamin K1, but if you are on a blood thinner, if you're on high levels, you're probably okay taking some, but always check with the doctor providing you with the blood thinner because you can actually check a blood test to see how your blood thinning is working. If you're taking some supplement and your blood is potentially too thinned, then potentially you want to dial it back or change your dosage of your blood thinner. That's a decent way to go about it. What type of vitamin K2 can you take? There's MK7 and MK4. Ideally, there's a lot of good supplements now that provide both. Both have benefits. Vitamin K2, MK7 has longer absorption, is more bioavailable, and is more efficient, but you also want MK4 as well. What kind of dosage do you want? In most of the studies, 90 micrograms to 360 micrograms are shown to work really well. But at the same time, you can get supplements now that include both MK7 and MK4 in a higher dosage. And at the same time, you can get a lot of your vitamin K2 through diet as well. This is a chart of the top 20 vitamin K2 foods, and ideally diet is the way to get it. So there's a Japanese fermented dish called natto. That's number one, and I have a whole video going about natto and the supplement natto kinase. So that's the natto kinase supplement right there. But cheeses as well, goose liver, chicken liver are also high options. You can see the first couple options have the most vitamin K2, but also eggs, Gouda cheeses, goose leg, pepperoni have some, salami has some. So you can see the deli meats, a lot of meats have vitamin K2. So vitamin K2 is a fatty supplement. It's a fatty vitamin that you can get in through your diet. It's also in butter. I have videos about butter as well. So MK4 and MK7. The MK4 lasts shorter, but potentially has better absorption. Or MK7 lasts a little bit longer, but potentially has worse absorption. So getting it through your diet, this is foods that will give you a nice mix of it. So I'm not picking one vitamin K or the other. This is a good option to get it through diet. So as a supplement, you want your 90 to 360 milligrams per day. And a lot of supplements now, in a practical sense, you could get it both with all the mixtures of MK4 and MK7 with your vitamin D as well. So you could get one of the combo ones and I link those below, but taking a look at all the studies, the average doses were 90 to 360 micrograms. And most of the studies now are very encouraging, especially for bone health and for limiting arterial calcification. It might not reverse it all the way, but it can help you stay healthier and just work it in as part of your supplement routine. That's the best way to go about it, in my opinion.